Good morning, everyone. It was wonderful to finally sleep after my 30 hours of travel to get here yesterday. Um, and the jet lag did not uh, affect me, so I'm very happy for that. It was easy to sleep last night. It was very good. So I hope you had a good rest as well. I want to remind you, if you did not pick up uh, a book last night, if you were not here, I have a book available, a journal about divine appointments, and there's information about um, just uh, picking up one of those um, that you can meet me right over there and I can help you with that. But I want to start today again with a video. Um, as I mentioned, um, I am working with Child Impact International, and we do two things. We empower children through Ad Adventist education and mission schools, kids that couldn't afford to go to schools in poor countries all around the world, and we also are leading the fight against human trafficking. So this video uh, comes from the mountain villages, uh, mountain villages of Palawan in the Philippines. It's five minutes long, and uh, we'll start with that, and then we'll get into our red carpet service presentation. Palawan has been voted the number one island in the world by travel and leisure four years running. It is an amazing place. The beautiful beaches, the clear waters, the coconut trees, the magnificent mountains. And yet there's a reality that most of them never see. And that is the remote jungle villages in the mountains. Individuals who live there are isolated from the rest of society there, and many of their customs are still carried on, including child marriage and child brides. Girls at a very young age are married off. In fact, we know of a girl at one of the schools, uh, near where one of the schools is located, that is recently married, and she's just 12 years old. We met another young lady who gave birth to a baby. Um, in fact, folk didn't even know she was pregnant until right before she was due, and there was an emergency because she was not feeling well. They flew her out of the mountains, and uh, she had a baby and almost died. Child marriage is something that the Philippine government is concerned about. Last year, they passed legislation stating that child brides being married under the age of 18 is illegal, and yet this still takes place in these mountainous remote regions. And so we believe that through Operation Child Rescue, we can intervene and provide a different path for these girls. Uh, when they get married, when they have a baby, typically education just stops at that point. Any hopes that they had, any dreams that they had of a future career, a future different path than just sustenance living is gone. And so when education is an option for them, it gives them a different path from the cultural and economic pressures that they face to marry at a young age. We will see these promising young people excelling academically, excelling spiritually, and then the next thing we know, they're gone. This pressure comes to them from their culture, their parents. Um, oftentimes, I hate to say it, it's almost like the children are being sold. Um, they're more interested in the dowry than the future of the child or the, the, the child's well-being. And so time and time again, our teachers will call us up and, and, and be in tears. Um, we lost another one, and no, they didn't die. But again, the family put the pressure on. It's, a, it's almost a forced marriage. Um, so we see the, the, these are children having children. <laughs> um, then we see them later on. They're not smiling. They have babies in their arms. Um, they still will maybe, you know, come to church but there's like a sparkle gone out of their eyes. And I... It's too hard. It's too much. The Palawan are beautiful people. But we recognize, because of sin, every culture is broken. And we recognize that there's a universal moral norm. Of course, we know it's biblical. It's not okay for a child to get married. And it's not okay for a child to give birth to a child. Not only is it dangerous, but it's also not right. And so my hope, my prayer, is that through these schools, that there'll be a different generation that will rise up, that will recognize that this is not a requirement. This is not the way that things have to be done, that there is a better way and that there is a way out.
uh, there's nothing more rewarding than seeing the hope come into these young people's lives. The hope of what God wants to do in their lives, um, the hope of what they might be able to achieve in their lives with God's help. But then when you see that hope leave them um, by the early marriage, by um, the abuse really that comes in these situations, that's where the pain comes in. Um, many times our teachers are calling us and they are in tears. Um, so it's, it's still a problem. We are seeing improvements though. Um, and, and I can't put my finger on exactly what's bringing it, but somehow we are watching our students um, realizing that they actually have a choice. There is a lot of pressure. It comes from the family, it comes from the culture. But I just heard today actually on the mountain, a young woman said they didn't know they had a choice. And it, now they're learning to exercise that choice. So we're seeing some of our students delaying the marriages when the, um, the, the parents are pushing, um, when the young man is pushing. Um, they're saying, no, I want to finish my school. So we're getting a gleam of hope <laughs> that there, God can bring an answer to this problem. magazine that's being handed out. Uh, we publish five of these a year and it highlights our projects all around the world. Uh, this is an exciting one to visit. Um, if I had to hike up to that project, I would have probably not made it. Um, I uh, Intentionally, I'm building up to the next time I go there, so I'm physically in a good enough shape to make it there. But I went up on a helicopter and I was afraid of surviving that ride up. The helicopter was uh, built in 1959. And uh, the person that was the pilot is a mechanic as well as a, as a helicopter pilot. And unfortunately, this is the story you've heard about where uh, that helicopter went down. So I was on that very helicopter with um, Nurse Janelle, with Pilot Dan, three weeks before it went down. Um, huge tragedy there. And, um, you know, the evidence of the only thing they found was a pillow and a pair of shoes. Uh, so an oil slick, you know, perhaps it was connected to it, but no sign um, of any, any other debris. So quite a tragic uh, experience there, but these individuals obviously dedicate their lives and lost their lives even in being dedicated to help these children in these remote villages. Um, and, you know, this whole issue of child marriage, uh, parents want a daughter, so they have, uh, you know, some income. And it's Basically, it can be a, a goat or a couple goats or chickens or a cow or a, a bag of candy. I mean, these are the kind of things that the girls are being sold off early, um, much before they should be. And it's at risk to them um, in terms of if they get pregnant to have a baby at that age. Um, the little boy you saw at the very end playing with the football, uh, his name is um, Baby James. And uh, his mother was a child bride who died in childbirth. And the father had superstitions, so he uh, felt like the baby represented bad luck. So he placed the baby next to the corpse of the mother uh, for the elements to take his life. And one of the teachers who had grown up in missionary homes who had been adopted heard about it. And she hiked from another village for a couple of hours to come rescue baby James and to adopt him. That being said, she did not have the resources to raise a baby or to pay for an adoption. And so Child Impact stepped in and helped with that adoption and helped her with some costs to be able to take care of baby James. But we're doing a lot in these villages. Uh, we partner with AFM. Uh, they ask us if we would partner with them for their schools. Um, we already had five schools with this organization, Palmas, they're called, and uh, that we already were partnering with. And they saw that and said, we need your help with the schools here in this. So we have all the schools in that region. We're supporting the children uh, to be able to go to school. And we're just now completing an industrial building so that the boys will stay in school rather than dropping out and then wanting a child bride. But unfortunately, it's not always a, another teenager that's looking for a teenage bride. It's sometimes older men that are wanting these child brides as well. So it's definitely a, a practice that is not a biblical one and one that we want to work to help um, mitigate against. So Anyway, that's part of our Operation Child Rescue Initiative, which is intended to fight human trafficking. And because the dowry comes into play as a major factor here, it's considered to be human trafficking. 
All right, um, so if you get the magazine, uh, feel free to look through that. We may have some time for some questions at the end of our key presentation today um, for Sabbath School. Let me just close this down, and we will go there right now. Okay. Okay, so I've entitled this presentation Red Carpet Service. Uh, this is one of my favorite ones to present, and I think you'll see why in a moment, um, because I think all of us, you see a bus like this, I think you're ready to get on and go for a ride. It looks quite nice. That's what we want, um, but this is often what we deliver. <laughs> this is what we want if we're going to be taking a nice vacation, but this is sometimes what we deliver. Have any of you ever stayed in a motel <laughs> or a moel? Unfortunately, I've had that experience, and I had guests in the room with me of the insect variety, and uh, it was not a pleasant experience. Um, in fact, very near where we lived in Michigan for a while, there was a Comfort Sites, and they changed their name a few days later to the Comfort Suits. I think when one starts to go out, you probably should change all of them, right? <laughs> um, this is what we want. Doesn't this look like a beautiful place to have a, a nice dinner? But this is what we deliver. A very creative use of some ketchup and mustard in this particular case. How about the Gold Corral? This is what we want, and sometimes this is what we deliver. So let's take this to church. This is what we want, a nice, beautiful setting there, and sometimes this is what we deliver. So I want to ask you a question. Where did this concept of red carpet service come from? What country did it come from? If we were to guess, we'd probably say it must be a British concept, right? But no, it actually came from the United States. And it began with a, with, a, with a train that was called the 20th Century Limited. This train would embark and start in New, York, in New York. They would roll out a red carpet for individuals to walk onto the train. And they'd roll it back up, put it on the train. And when they got off in Chicago, they rolled the red carpet out again. And thus was born the concept of red carpet service. Well, who in our society today receives red carpet service? Who? Okay. Pastors. Did somebody say pastors? <laughs> we would say definitely celebrities, right? Uh, government officials. Here we have some examples of, of red carpet service. And I want to ask you a, a simple question that I would like for you to re reflect on honestly. And I'm just going to pick one couple that gets red carpet service wherever they go, and that is William and Kate. If William and Kate were scheduled to visit your church this next Sabbath, what would you do differently? And surprisingly, some people say to me, I wouldn't do anything differently. I don't believe it for a second. First of all, uh, you would be there pretty early because you want to make sure that you had a place to park, right? And there would be certain things that would, the, the toilets I don't think would be backed up. Or I think if there was a leak in the, in the restrooms, you would have it fixed. Um, you would make sure that things were smelling nice, that the greeters were in place and ready, that the bulletin, bulletin didn't have any typos in it. Uh, there would be all sorts of things we would do in preparation for an honored guest that might be arriving. And so... I think this is something that is, um, is something that we need to be thinking about because even though it happens on a weekly basis, we are worshiping the king of the universe. And I want to just share a biblical basis for red carpet service and for excellence. And I'll begin by sharing a story that I experienced in England. Um, I enjoy international travel. I usually travel with either a family member or some friends when I do that, and here we are at Stonehenge in England, and we were booked into a particular hotel called Premier Inn. Now, Premier Inn 
is, as you look at it, it's a very basic accommodation. This is not over the top. But what they are known for uh, is their fantastic breakfast, their breakfast that is fit for kings. So let me just share what, with you what that can look like. Um, and as I experienced this, it, uh, it was quite exciting for me that this was the place I would be staying during my entire visit, even though I would be changing uh, cities, I would still be transferring over to another premier inn. Because look at this. Here's some porridge with some black currants and some red currants and other kinds of berries there. Um, that looks quite nice, doesn't it? And then I moved on to have some steamed tomatoes and mushrooms. So again, this is like, for me being uh, primarily a vegan, this is quite an enjoyable breakfast that I'm in, uh, going through here. And then out come the veggie sausages. What hotel serves veggie sausages made with leeks? I mean, this was an absolute incredible experience. It was truly breakfast fit for a king. And yet, as we transferred to the new hotel, everything changed. It's like, what is going on here? You know, I had an expectation. It was the same company. How could I be having two very different experiences? It, on the outside, appeared to be the same. It was the same logo, the same welcome booklet, the same use of purple as their theme color, the same type of room keys, the same breakfast price, even the same breakfast items advertised. But the difference came in the details. At the first hotel, everything was fresh and available. At the second one, they were out of eggs and mushrooms. The first one had soft crumpets. The next one, they were hard, and, and you can choose to make a soft one hard in the toaster. This is kind of like an English muffin type of thing, a British English muffin, right? Perfectly done veggie sausages. The second one had hard ones. Soy milk. Well, it was on the menu, so the first day I was there, I asked about the soy milk, and they said, we're so sorry, sir, we ran out. We will have it here tomorrow. And the next day, there was the soy milk. At the second hotel, they said, sir, we don't receive too many requests for that, so we no longer make that available. It was advertised, but they were unwilling to offer it. Fresh currants, there were none at the second one. A large variety of dried fruits and nuts, there were half of the options in the next one. At the first hotel, our team of three could hardly wait for our breakfast fit for a king the next morning. At the second hotel, I showed up one morning for breakfast and the other two guys weren't even there. They said, we think we'll skip breakfast this morning. What a difference. The difference was in the details. Now... You know that this has to apply to what we're here for with revitalization this weekend. We can have the same denomination, but very different experiences from church to church. We have the same logo. We believe in the same 28 fundamental beliefs. We have the same church manual. We have the same prophetic message in the day of worship and the same Advent hope. But there can be huge differences in the details. So now I want to challenge us, regardless of where your church is at when it comes to excellence and doing things well, I want to share with you the biblical foundation of why this is important. First of all, excellence is a biblical concept. Do you believe that? Excellence is a biblical concept. God saw all that he made and it was what? Very good. And there was evening and there was morning the sixth day. Now, in the book of Haggai 1, verses 5 and 6, God rebukes the returning exiles, and he says this, give careful thought to your ways. Pay attention to the details. You planted much, but you harvested little. You eat, but never have enough. You drink, but never have your fill. You put on clothes, but are not warm. You earn wages only to put uh, them in a purse with holes in it. I mean, some of us feel like that maybe between paychecks, Right? But they were not paying attention to the details that God had asked them to pay attention to. And then we come to the kind of response here that brings it all together, where God says, you expected much, but see, it turned out to be little. What you brought home, I blew away. Why, declares the Lord? Because of my house, which remains a ruin, while each of you is busy with your own house. I believe that if you were to conduct your employment, 
your place of employment, if you were to conduct things in the way that they are done in the local church, that you might be without a job. Have we ever thought about that? We, do our, we go to our place of employment and we dress up and we, things are in order and we're on time with our, you know, with our um, different duties at work and, and we interact in a pleasant way with our various work associates and we come to each church and we avoid each other in the hall and, and things are in disarray and they're not organized and they're not planned and the person gets up to sing, didn't even practice. Now we don't even know what hymn we're going to be turning to. I mean, we can't do this in our workplace and yet we do it at church, and this is what God is saying here. Hey, each of you are really interested in your own house and making sure that's nice and comfortable, but you're not even paying any attention to my house. And so that was something that God found disturbing. And uh, this was something else that was going on. When it came to giving God his sacrifice, the sacrificial system of the Old Testament, they had been kind of trying to give him the rejects. This is a lamb that has a few extra legs. These were the kind of sacrifices they were bringing to God. He says this, When you bring injured, lame, or diseased animals and offer them as sacrifices, should I accept them from your hand, says the Lord. What do you think God's going to say? Cursed is the cheat who has an acceptable male in the flock and vows to give it, but then sacrifices a blemished animal to the Lord. For I am a great king, says the Lord of hosts, and my name is to be feared among the nations. God is to be given the best sacrifice. Now, of course, there's an application as we come across into the New Testament. That sacrificial system has been left behind, but there are parallels to the New Testament church. You also, like living stones, are being built into a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood offering spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. Therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy, pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. So I want to take a look at this. Is our human sacrifice that we're offering to God, is it of the best quality? When we think about preparing to welcome the Sabbath, our family devotions, our personal devotions, our family time with our spouse and children, our entertainment, our free time, giving to God's work and our use of money, health, how are we doing when it comes to offering our best gift to God, if our bodies are truly the sacrifice that God is asking for? Can what we offer God personally or as a church ever be described in these ways? And I've purposely put it on a very drab slide. Can it be described as the leftovers? As second rate, substandard, inferior, poor quality, shoddy, shabby, careless, and I'm going to use a few Australian phrases here because I lived there for a while, lackadaisical, and I love these ones, it's a bit dodgy, or shonky. Those are really good words, aren't they? But they mean it's just not, it's just not there, the quality is just not there. Or, can what we offer God be described as excellent, first rate, first class, superior, and here's a couple of Australian phrases, good on you, mate, or Bob's your uncle, or bonza, or outstanding, acceptable, top-notch, superb quality, red carpet service. Now here's a phrase I think that's very important for us to remember. Excellence honors God and inspires people. You wonder why your church grow isn't growing? I want you to look at this next quote. This one is a powerful one to me. The enthusiasm of the guest experience can never rise any higher than the enthusiasm of your own employees. Let's trans that, translate that to the church. How would we say that? The enthusiasm of a visitor to your church can never rise higher than the enthusiasm of your own members. Do you see the truth in this? If you're not excited about your church, how do you expect anybody else to be? It won't happen. It's not even a possibility. Now, this photo that I chose to put here is a significant one for me because these are two boys that we adopted. And we had the privilege of being able to host them in our home for Christmases and summers for several times in a row. And if you'd like to know how you can host an orphan in your home, 
Come and talk with me afterwards and I'll be glad to give you those details. But we would pick them up in Chicago. We lived near Andrews University. And at that time, there was not a Costco close to Andrews. And so we would make our regular Costco shop uh, stop on the way back from getting them in the airport. Well, here we are, and um, th- these two boys are very fascinated, want to be involved in whatever they can be. And uh, you see that uh, Andres up there, he would put his mouth on everything, and that's on the, yeah, no, probably not a good idea here in this case. But there is Daniel who discovered this scanner to scan the groceries. And he was showing so much interest in it that the lady that was checking us out handed him the scanner and let him scan the groceries for us. Now, on the way out, uh, I was so impressed. I thanked the management for that, and I actually wrote a letter to Costco thanking them for giving our kids such an amazing experience in going to their store. Well, they actually published it, uh, which was you know, with this photo. So that was pretty exciting. But I can tell you that her enthusiasm, see the smile on her face? That translated into how we felt about our Costco experience, didn't it? And it's, it's powerful, this effect. If someone is enthusiastic, and it begins with the pastors, it begins with the elders and the leaders. If you don't have an enthusiasm for your church, my hope is that throughout this presentation, you'll begin to gain some ideas of how you can take things to the next level so that you can feel enthusiastic about your church. All right. For out of the fullness the overflow, the, uh, the superabundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. We can't help but talk about those things we're excited about. This is why we began last night talking about divine appointments and praying every day that God will give us an interaction with someone. When you've had that experience during the week, you are coming to church with a different mindset, a different level of enthusiasm than if you had not had those experiences with God and with others during the week. I want to share another illustration of this in the fact that we talk about things that we are excited about. This is the city of Riga, Latvia. It's in Eastern Europe. It borders Russia. This is where we adopted our two boys from. And it's a beautiful city. You can see that. I mean, the colors are just stunning there. And it's well kept, very clean. But if you mention to somebody that you are going to visit the country of Latvia, Within a few moments in that conversation, they will make this statement to you. You have to go to Lido. Has Lido advertised, this is a restaurant, has, have they advertised to that individual, are they giving that individual a commission to tell you that you have to go to Lido? Why are they talking about it? Because the experience they had there was so amazing that they want you to share that as well. And so Lido, I, you know, I try to take pictures, and they don't let you take pictures in, inside of the restaurant, but every time I go to Latvia, we make an effort to go multiple times <laughs> to visit Lido, because it's a very special place. And as I began reflecting on this, I realized that I grew up with such an experience in Walla Walla, Washington, the town's so good that they named it twice. There is a place in Walla Walla that does not have to advertise. They don't have to have an advertising budget. Why? Because everyone talks about it. In fact, they are not even on a main street. They're one block off a main street. But everybody finds it. And that place is called the Iceberg. It's just a little out of the beaten place. Have anybody been to Iceberg? Look at this. See, there we go. It's not an avenous place even. Um, And yet, here's in this audience right here, there's people who have been to Iceberg. Why? Word of mouth, right? They have uh, their onion rings there. They have their famous burgers. And they have 37 different flavors of shakes. And you can combine weird combinations there and say you want a uh, black licorice and orange or whatever you want, right? Uh, Flavors you can put together. How about a bubblegum Oreo? Anyway, it's a, it's, a, it's a place that just grows by word of mouth. Another place in Walla Walla that did that is called Roger's Bakery. And I remember that, and what they're famous for is what? They're maple bars. They never make enough. It seems like they always run out. So you've got to be there early in the morning to get their maple bars. And going to high school, there would be donut runs to Roger Baker, Roger's Bakery. These places don't need to advertise. Why? 
because they grow by word of mouth. And so I have a question for you. What if God's church, what if your church grew by word of mouth? Now, Pastor Brad, have I been talking about my home church a bit since I arrived? I love my home church, the College Dell Community Church. It is an amazing church. I love my pastors. I love my interaction with church members there. It is the most streamlined worship service of any Adventist church I've ever been to. They cut out everything but what is considered to be essential. Because they want to know if you invite a guest to church that they're not going to have to wonder what is going on this week. Because every week you can count on what is, what, what's going to be delivered and it's going to be done well and with excellence. All right, so here's the word of mouth factor. What exceptional experience takes place at your church that people leave talking about? I'd like for you to turn to someone and share that. What exceptional experience, and it's something that happens on a weekly basis. What exceptional experience happens at your church that people leave talking about? Go ahead and share that with the person next to you. Okay, let's come back together. Were you able to identify something? If you haven't, then I would ask you this question. How could you identify a standout experience that will create enthusiasm for members and guests? Do you think that's important? I think it absolutely is. And there's so many different ways that this can happen, and we'll unpack some of those. What's the motivation for excellence? Even so you. Since you are zealous for spiritual gifts, let it be for the edification of the church that you seek to excel. Why do we want to do things well? To build up God's church so God's church can grow. That's why we do it. It's not because it's what, you know, we, we just, our own personal interest is we want to see God's church grow through it. So there's something at churches that can be called the holy huddle. The members enthusiastically tell you how friendly their church is. However, you begin to notice that other than the formal greeting at the door, visitors are pretty much ignored, and it seems that members are friendly among themselves. What are three steps you can take to become a visitor-friendly church? This is all too often the case where we have a holy huddle and a church perceives themselves as being friendly, but the reality is visitors don't have that same experience. I remember visiting a church in Texas, and I won't share with you where it's at because there's a pastor from Texas right here. <laughs> Used to be from Texas, right? So I was visiting with this church, and, and they were one that struggled with church health. And you're familiar with natural church development and church health. And their score was very, very low in loving relationships. So I simply asked the question, can you share with me why your church scored low in this particular category of loving relationships? And member after member, oh, pastor, we're a loving church. Oh, pastor, this is, a very, this is one of the most loving churches I've ever been to. And I'm thinking, what is going on here? I said, uh, friends, I did not fill out this survey. You did. Something is not adding, me, adding up here. You're telling me you're a friendly church, and I'm seeing this score that says you're struggling in loving relationships. Finally, this lady timidly raised her hand. She said, this is a very unloving church unloving church and the tears start to flow and then the reality hit there are a few of them that are quite loving with each other but new people were left on the outside and it was a holy huddle that was going on that was not a holy way to function as a church and so this is a challenge that I think we need to look at you see the difference between an average church and a church of excellence is attention to little details 
What are some of the little details that a church should pay attention to? Let's take a look. A case study here. A new family shows up to church. A husband, a wife, and 2.3 children. Why 2.3 children? She's expecting, okay? All right. So what are the three most important places in the church for this family? I heard somebody. Children's Sabbath school. Okay? All right. What else? The women's bathroom. What else? The mother's room or the nursery, right? If your church can win on all three of those, you've got this family. They're going to join your church. And it's not just the quality and the cleanliness and things being well, the decor looking good. It's about how people treat them that oversee these ministries as well. That's the most important part. But it's not an excuse to undo the other things, of things being clean and quality and, and, and the decor being beautiful and all of this, all right? I uh, went to a friend's church and he said, please don't tell anybody about this. <laughs> because I, was, I pulled up my camera and started taking some pictures. This is the most creative way to fix a leak that I have ever seen. And for the ladies who don't know what this is, this is a urinal in a men's bathroom, okay? And it has sprung a leak and a very creative funnel was found that could be zip tied. You can almost do anything with zip ties, right? Well, unfortunately, in the same bathroom was a sink that also had some leaks. And it says, out of order, does not work, drain leaks. Now, what is your experience going to be as a guest walking into this bathroom? It's going to be a little underwhelming, right? Are these some little details that a church may want to pay attention to? Here's the challenge. When we go week after week, we stop noticing these things. And that's why sometimes it's important to invite someone with fresh eyes who's never, who've never been there before to just do an inventory of your church. How were you received? Have a mystery guest show up and see what their experience is. I remember one, one church I was pastoring that Paul Hunt also pastored. Um, you know, Texas would have these, these droughts, and the grounds were in disrepair. I mean, it was, there were dirt and clumps of grass and weeds and no flowers, and, and yet this was a large church. And because it had been that way for so long, the members stopped noticing until one of the members said, you know what, none of us are taking care of this. We need to hire someone to do it. Oh, that means paying for something. Yep, but it needs to get done because you've had your chance and you've not taken care of it. We're going to hire somebody to be in charge of landscaping for our church. When the landscaping started to improve, everyone noticed what they hadn't been noticing before and say, wow, things look really beautiful. Those flowers are nice. We kind of feel better walking into church now because things look better. And so I think we kind of get used to the clutter. We get used to that that pulpit we don't use anymore being stored down at the end of the hallway with a stack of trash or um, board minutes from three years ago, and, and we just accept those things, and the baptistry being filled up and used as storage and these kind of things. And so we need to be taking a look at our churches with fresh eyes. So what are some of the little details that a church should pay attention to? How about when it comes to parking? Do you have accessible parking for guests? What messages are you leaving in the parking lot for people that, uh, that enter? And, and I can give you so many examples in each of these of ways to take it to the next level. How about with greeting? Do the greeters only stay until the opening song starts and then they disappear? And so the latecomers have nobody to welcome them or accidentally go in the wrong door. Um, our bulletin, is it presented well? Um, our sound system, is it working? Children's story, does it go too long every week? Um, the sermon, has it been prepared? Video projection, church grounds, toilets, foyer, communion, mother's room, children's classrooms, fellowship meal, visitors, flow of the worship service, all these things we can look at. There's a, a church in Texas that I like to, um, to talk about in this regard. Um, they claim that they had the best potluck in town. Now, I was the official potluck analyst of the Texas conference. It was a self-appointed uh, part of my job, and I had this running list of the five best potlucks in the conference, but I also had probably five that I want to avoid because they kind of stay with you all day long. But this particular church, when they had a fellowship, have a fellowship meal, um, what do you see happening here? 
they're keeping the food warm. If, if food is supposed to be hot when it's served, serve it hot. We're told what happens to lukewarm things in the book of Revelation. We spew them out of our mouths. So they keep them uh, warm. And look at this. Service with, a, you know, with, with first class here. I mean, this is, this is amazing. Walking through and this is somebody coming around to see if anybody wants seconds. And uh, then you see that they have a, a large amount of a good variety of food there. Now, I want to just share with you one illustration from this particular church. They're having a women's ministry meeting. Are any of you involved in women's ministry? Okay. All right. I see Linda and I see a couple over here. When we have a meeting, we sometimes have food, right? We can put a two liter of soda on the, on the table and maybe a, a jug of juice and find a few cups somewhere. But at this particular church... Um, they decided when they have a women's ministry meeting that it should look more like this. This is just a planning meeting for those involved in women's ministry. Do you think you would be ready to sign up to be a part of this group? Say somebody really cares about what's going on here, right? It has an impression. It's like something as good is going to happen. And so just super impressive that way. Um, one, one area I want to just draw our attention to is that of singing. Organize a company of who? The best singers. Is everybody a good singer? Not everybody has the gift of singing, all right? And so my wife and I are not signing up to do a duet at your next um, conference here. That is not something that we've been gifted with. Could we make our way through it? We love to sing joyfully to the Lord, but we're probably not the ones that we should be doing a duet. Or maybe I should speak for myself. I should not be doing a solo. Um, let all who will unite with them. Okay, now I want you to notice this. This highlighted phrase is, is pointing back to the best singers. The best singers should do what? Devote some time to practice. Even the best singers should devote some time to practice. Do you hear me? The best singers should devote some time to practice. That they may employ this talent, how? To the glory of God. Did that message come through clearly? All right. Very good. This is the Alpha International Church during their praise and worship. Do you think they've done some things intentionally here? I mean, they've even coordinated their, entire, uh, their attire, right? And take a look at the overall impression you have looking at the sanctuary there. It's full, isn't it? Do you think they go from their church and people that visit go and talk about it? And I'm ta I've talked about it all around the world because of my experience there and what that was like. So I want to share with you my top five red carpet awards. And some of these are from a number of years ago. Some of them are more recently. But uh, it just gives you an idea of what some churches do to kind of take that, that thing that goes by word of mouth, right, that we want to have. All right, so Cowboy Church, uh, Hugs and a Loaf of Bread. So as part of the worship service and the welcome of guests, children come down the aisle, a couple of children come down the aisle of the church and uh, the, where they first come to the front and they pick up baskets with loaves of bread in the baskets. And the loaves of bread have, they're professionally wrapped with ingredients listed on them. That's important, isn't it? And so it's announced if you're a guest with us today, uh, we've prepared a special loaf of bread for you. And as these young people come by, just raise your hand up and they will give you a loaf of bread. Do you think that's better than asking a, a guest to stand up and introduce themselves? <laughs> Guests don't enjoy that. You know, they want to be incognito, but if they simply have to raise their hand up like this to get a loaf of bread, they're going to do it. Now, this is brilliant because what happens after this? Your members are trained, go to anybody who has a loaf of bread and make sure they feel welcomed. So the visitors have self-identified and the members now have a task to go and make sure they're especially friendly to those that are carrying a loaf of bread. So I, I love it and I've seen a number of churches, I, I've seen a church in Australia, in Tamworth, um, give a jar of honey because that's something that's very common in their area and it's where a lot of honey is uh, produced and so the guests all go home with a, a jar of honey, a gift from the Tamworth Seventh-day Adventist Church. So similar kind of concept, Right. But I love uh, guests self-identifying in order to get that loaf of bread. And there's many churches doing that now. I've been promoting this for a lot of years, and some have gotten that idea from me, and others have got it from somewhere else. But nevertheless, to give your guest 
a gift is one way to go to the next level in our guest experience. Is that all right? Next one here is from Australia, the Raymond Terrace Baptisms and their breakfast and lunch. Now, their average natural church development score is 80. That is off the charts. That's incredible for an average, right, Brad? This is way up there. Now, they make a very big deal of baptisms, and because they do, and they focus on that, they have a lot of baptisms. But what I love about this church is they have breakfast and lunch every week. Do you know the thing I hear more and more from churches is it's a lot of work to have fellowship lunch. Well, let's just stay home and watch the, let's watch someone else preach online. I mean, you can watch John Bradshaw preach. Goodness, I mean, he probably, he might preach better than your preacher. I don't know. I mean, is Steve Danes your pastor? Then not sure about that. But, you know, you, you can stay, why not stay home? It's because we're to fellowship with one another, right? And so if we're sitting The whole time we're in church, and we're sitting there, and we're looking at the back of someone else's head, and that's the only experience that we have the whole time we're at church, why are we even going? Do you understand what I'm saying? And so we need to be looking at more opportunities for fellowship, not less. And so this church said, let us have breakfast every single week. Let us have lunch every single week. And I'm not trying to stretch you to the breaking point because that may be like, wow, that's just way out there. But if you're doing one lunch a month, go to two. If you're doing two, go to four. But you know the problem with that is people, when you feel like what you're doing, you do not know if it makes a difference or not. It's hard to continue doing good. But let's say right here, if you bring, what's your favorite dish to cook? Do you have a favorite dish? Lasagna. And your name? Dana. Dana. Okay. So Dana has brought her lasagna to church. And you've been doing this every week and nobody ever says anything. How does that feel? Disappointing. It's disappointing, isn't it? Because you took probably a couple hours to make that lasagna. But if you as an elder or you as a leader, and I believe one of our most important jobs as a leader in the church is to be a cheer person a cheerleader. And if I go up to Dana, say, Dana, thanks for bringing your lasagna. I know you bring it every week, but I saw a guest came today and they went back for seconds. I know they loved it because I went and asked them how they enjoyed the food and they said, that lasagna was amazing. Thank you for what you're doing. It's making a difference. Wow, there's a little more skip in her step. She's going to the store and saying, okay, I'm going to make another lasagna. Do you see the difference? But if nobody ever says anything, of course it feels like work to do potluck. But when you're bringing these dishes and people are appreciated and you see the guests enjoying and they stay by and they want to come back, this is why this church does breakfast and lunch every week. And I signed up, actually, I think I'm going to share with you, yep, I'm going to give you a very special recipe so have your phones ready in just a moment, okay? Here we go. So here's their baptisms. You can see the big deal that they make here. They'll go out to the ocean for a baptism or they'll go to a swimming pool. But they have a baptism gift basket budget and they customize it based on what they know that baptismal candidate would appreciate. And it's to help them in their, in their journey with Jesus. Um, but you can see here these individuals are baptized, presented with these special gifts at their baptism. So it's a big deal. But my family signed up to do breakfast once, once a, a month for this church. And I pulled out my famous vegan banana carob waffle recipe. So here it is. Go for it. You can take your pictures. And this is a, a place to start with. We have friends in Australia that send me pictures when they make, make these waffles, and uh, they are a hit. So play around with the little ingredients, the ingredients a little bit. I'm not sure the measurements are exact, um, but uh, anyway, I kind of just do it from memory now. <laughs> um, but enjoy this one uh, as a way to think about a breakfast. Okay, coming in at number three, Avondale College First Impressions Team. As you drive up to the Avondale University, Avondale University now, as you drive up to the church, you will see young people holding brightly colored, colorful signs with messages for you as you're driving in. You belong here. So glad you're here. I mean, from the moment you're driving in, there's an impression that's being made. And how would you like to see, ladies, how would you like to see a sign like this? You look amazing. How does that feel, right? You see something like that driving in, you look amazing. 
And then here, have a good Sabbath, have a great week. All these different kind of messages that they're communicating as people are driving in. I believe one of the easy steps, next level steps with um, red carpet service is to have a parking lot greeter with a high-vis vest on, when it's raining to have an umbrella, when people are trying to carry multiple things to help carry things in. Greeting people, not waiting for them to stumble through the door and figure out how can I get this door open or maybe opening the door for them as a, as a kind gesture, but to be there in the parking lot to welcome them when they first drive in, even if it's to wave as they're parking, but that high-vis vest on to show that you're there on an official, you're not somebody that's, you know, kind of, Hoo -hoo. you know, you're there because you're officially welcoming them to church, right? And, uh, and that feels good. Next one here. Uh, oh, 3B. The hot breakfast at Gateway Church in Kernbog, Australia. So, hey, with such awesome signs going up just down the road, another church, they've got to step up their game, right? If they're they're going to lose everybody to that church over there. So they, they're saying, look at, look at this breakfast that we can serve. I mean, that's like an official hotel serving buffet unit, right? And, uh, and they have their breakfast there. Uh, and look at what happens when you bring this kind of quality and this kind of intention. Um, details there with that. But look at, look at this, dairy-free. They knew I was coming this particular day, so they had a vegan kind of uh, nice fruit, fruit um, dessert type thing there. But look at this. What do you see happening here? A lot of connection, right? A lot of connection going on. All right, number two, San Antonio Phil Am's music ministry. Um, what I loved about this is a couple of things. One is the unconventional way to think about evangelism dollars. If the only way we think about evangelism is mailing brochures with beast pictures, um, we need to catch up to the secular society that we live in. God is always working on people's hearts. In some cases, people will respond to those things. But here we have a church that said, we want to teach young people how to play musical instruments. We're Filipino. We have these instruments that we play. Any young person who wants to learn how to play, we will offer them a free instrument with our evangelism funds. And we will give them music lessons. And so they created this incredible music ensemble that they played. And uh, many young people were baptized through their music ministry as, as, as well as their Saturday night basketball social get-togethers that they had. They did not need to spend very many evangelism funds to get a lot of big results because they were intentional about who they were trying to reach and how they were trying to do it. Number one here, and uh, a number of churches are doing this now, and there's a principle here that is different that may not apply to your church in, in the specific here, and that's a, a golf cart ministry, parking lot golf cart ministry. And this comes back to the idea of greeting people when they first arrive. I'm a golf cart driver at my home church. I signed up for that, and I get the opportunity to, not everybody takes a ride, but I get to op the opportunity to be the first to greet them on Sabbath morning. And uh, even if they don't take the ride, it gives an impression. And again, that may not be what fits for your church. You may have a small parking lot where everybody parks close. But what would it be if somebody was standing out there to welcome people, to help them carry things in, an umbrella on a rainy day, um, we even had it at the church I was at in North Dallas for a period of time. We had valet parking that we offered for people that want to pull up to the front door because the parking lot was full and we park across the street and then we go back and, and get them their vehicle after church. Of course, all the youth wanted to sign up for that, but that was not something we allowed. <laughs> but beyond red carpet is something called purple carpet service. Um, this is something that I've coined myself. But when it came to the Sydney Opera House, red carpet was not good enough. It had to be purple carpet. And I've had a few rare experiences in my ministry travels where purple carpet service was something that I received. Now, the irony we, is we should not leave all this to the world. I was just at a, a lodge in Tanzania where I was staying where we received purple carpet treatment. They kind of every day tried to outdo themselves in the decorations they did with towels on our bed and flower petals. And uh, it ended with two swans that were, you know, greeting each other and with the uh, flowers all around. And, and so we'd walk into our room this way. When we left, there was a personal note given to us by one who served meals to us um, and a gift that he gave us that was something that had nothing to do with the hotel. It was something from him personally. 
And so you see this and say, well, that's next level. And what does that do? Do you think I want to ever think of staying anywhere else when I go back to Tanzania? No, no way, no thank you. I'm going to go back there because I know the kind of reception that will be there. I mean, literally tearing up with us leaving. I mean, it, it was incredible, and our, and our group felt the same way because of the bond that happened there, staying in a lodge for six nights. So why should the world have all of this? So I was at the Manitoba, Saskatchewan Conference camp meeting, and we're wrapping up now. Manitoba, Saskatchewan Conference camp meeting. I called back to my wife. And she said, um, somebody sent me flowers. So my first thought is, who is sending my wife flowers when I'm out of town? (laughs) Then she read me the note, and that note was from the Manitoba Saskatchewan Conference. They were thanking my wife for sharing my time with them because I was there for camp meeting and they knew I was away from home and sacrificed being away from home to share my time with them. So they wanted to thank my wife. Who does that? That's incredible, isn't it? That was like next level. And I was like, wow, that is absolutely purple carpet uh, treatment. So here are the four keys to raising quality for your church or your church plant. So here are the four keys, the principles to close. Quality must be deliberate. There needs to be intentionality. It's not going to happen just because we hope it will happen. We need to be intentional about it. Like we said, practice. We need to be prepared, right? Quality is required at all levels. Broad-based commitment is necessary. It's very nice if you figured out the greeting and how to be friendly as you welcome people and they go into your toilets and the bathrooms there and it stinks. A little bit of that pleasantness that they experienced in the greeting will be lost, right? So we need to think about broad-based quality in what we do. The third one here is you must practice what you'll deliver. If we want something to go well, we need to be prepared. We need to practice for it. And then, this is a very important one, you must be self-critical and welcome feedback. We should always be looking at what does it take to move things to the next level. So I hope that you're motivated with your church because the difference between an average church and a church of excellence is attention to the little details. Here's my email. Here's my phone number if you want to jot that down. Um, I will be coming by if some of you did not receive this magazine from Child Impact as you came in. I want to make sure all of you have that in your hands to read during Ted Wilson's sermon. All right.